Hello, everyone. I'm Kate Trinka, the Global Read Coordinator for the Charter for Compassion. Thanks for joining us tonight for our Global Read. We're so happy to have with us uh, Hugh Mackay, who is going to be discussing his book, The Inner Self, The Joy of Discovering Who We Really Are. Just a couple uh, quick announcements before we get started and introduce our guests today. Um, first, we'd like to thank all the generous donors that made it possible for us to keep, bring you this Global Read uh, at no cost. Um, if you'd like to sponsor a Global Read in the future, please contact me at kate at charterforcompassion.org. And some exciting news, we've got a, uh, another Australian author coming to us next month, uh, Tyson Yankaporta, who will be talking to us about his book, Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. So please mark your calendars and register for that Global Read as well. And we have two courses that I'd like to just quickly announce through the Charters Education Institute, Humanity 360, Environmental Concerns That Affect Us All, which starts on Monday of next week. So please join us for that. And then we have poetry course coming up in April. Uh, before I introduce our esteemed guests today, I'd just like to um, let you know that we have a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen for any questions that you might have for you or Lynn. Um, at the end of our program, we'll be all opening up for Q&A, but please feel free to put those questions in at any time during this, um, this webinar. And um, there's also a chat room available if you wanna make any comments there, I'll be uh, looking at that as well. So thank you again for being here. I'd like to introduce, first of all, our host for today's uh, program, Dr. Lynn Reeder. She is the National Director of the Australian Compassion Council and a member of the Compassionate Pilot Steering Group. She is an adjunct research fellow at the Federation University of Australia and a board director of the public interest think tank, Australia 21. Lynn writes on the evidence base of empathy and compassion, most recently with Professor Christine Wamsler and Mark Crossweller. She contributed a book chapter to the Routledge International Handbook of Urban Resilience in her research, Dr. Reeder is currently involved in a randomized control of 500 children, contributing to a global evaluation of the Early Childhood Think Equal program, an evaluation developed by the Center for Emotional Intelligence at Yale University. As a board director of Australia 21, Lynn is also the founder of the Mindful Futures Network, a network of well over 700 people who are interested in applying the evidence base of mindfulness, empathy, and compassion within Australian organizations. Lynn, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much. We're looking forward to your conversation with you. Mm -hmm. Let me take the time to introduce you right now. I'm gonna put his picture up here. All right. Um, Hugh is a social psychologist and researcher and the best-selling author of 21 books, including his latest, The Inner Self, which was published concurrently with his eighth novel, The Question of Love. He has had a 60-year career in social research and was also a weekly newspaper columnist for over 25 years. He is currently an honorary professor in the Research School of Psychology at AMU and a patron of the Asylum Seekers Center. Among other honorary appointments, he has been Deputy Chairman of the Australia Council for the Arts, the inaugural Chairman of the ACT Government's Community Inclusion Board, and an honorary professor at Macquarie, Olagong, and Charles Sturt Universities. Boy, I hope I didn't mess those up for you too bad. You. <laughs> He was a fellow of the Australian Psychological Society and Royal Society of NSW. In recognition of his pioneering work in social research, he has been awarded honorary doctorates by Charles Sturt, Macquarie, NSW, Western Sydney, and Wollongong Universities. He was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia in 2015. Wow, what an honor it is to have you here with us. Hugh, thank you so much for being here with us. And Lynn, I'm going to let you I take you from here. Good. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank, for, thank you for setting this up. 
Um, before I start, I would actually like to acknowledge the Indigenous lands on which I am situated, uh, Wadarong lands, and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, particularly uh, proud and pleased to have you be in conversation with you today um, because as well as all those wonderful things that Kate spoke about, Hugh is also the national ambassador for the, for the Australian Compassion Council and the work that we're doing here with the Charter in Australia. So Hugh, the way that we're going to do it is I'll hand over to Hugh shortly for an introductory statement then we'll have a conversation and then, uh, we'll, as Kate mentioned, we'll be opening it up for, for um, questions. So if you have those, you can be typing them in the chat box as we go along. So thank you, Hugh, and I'll hand over to you to start with. Thank you very much, uh, Lynn, and thank you, Kate, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like, like to begin, I just want to outline what this new book is about before Lynn and I start uh, talking about some questions that arise in her mind about it. Um, but I want to begin with a little story uh, concerning um, Emma Thompson, one of my favourite actors, uh, the British actor, who, when she was about to turn 60, she did an interview with Time magazine in which she said on the eve of her 60th birthday that she'd reached a point in her life where all the roles that society has so successfully forced upon you, from daughter to wife to mother to professional person, could be questioned. You could take these things away from your face, like masks, one after the other, and go, who actually am I? Which uh, Thompson said she had always thought was a terribly boring question, but now found fascinating. Well, turning 60 can do that to us, but so can turning 40, the famous midlife crisis, or 50, or even 80. Big life-changing events can do it. A divorce, a life-threatening illness, a brutal retrenchment, a bereavement, a pandemic, certainly. Pleasant upheavals can do it too, falling in love, the birth of a baby, the first day of a new job. But as I've mentioned already, the, for many of us, the trigger uh, for asking and facing that question, who am I really, is very often the midlife crisis. Typically occurs in our 40s uh, or 50s when we perhaps wake up one day and say, well, there must be more to life than this. I know there's more to me than this. Well, the ancient Greeks weren't kidding uh, when they promoted know thyself as the foundation of a complete and fulfilling life. The more we understand ourselves, the better equipped we are to lead a meaningful and purposeful life. To live in ignorance of who we really are is to live a kind of half-life, and who wants that? Now, a journey of self-reflection, self-examination, self self-discovery uh, is, is not going to guarantee a happy life but it won't just benefit and perhaps even transform us. It will also benefit the people we live amongst because only an authentic person can have authentic relationships. And self-knowledge is a necessary condition for an authentic life. Now, I'm talking about the self. Uh, as if it's one simple thing, but that can blind us to the fact that most of us have an outside self and an inside self. And in fact, the midlife crisis is often about sensing the gap between our outer and inner self. The outer self is what we normally call our personal identity. And identity, of course, a very fashionable word at the moment, uh, through from personal identity through to identity politics, but identity is all about the differences between us. As the word itself suggests, this is how we identify each other, how we distinguish one person from another. We, we define each other's identity by making comparisons and contrasts between us, emphasizing people's uniqueness, whether in appearance or ethnicity or gender, or intelligence or behavior 
or work or roles and responsibilities, ways of expressing ourselves and so on. I mean, in my case, uh, if you say, who am I? I could give you an identity answer that would be, well, I'm a man, uh, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a brother, uh, I'm a, a social researcher, I'm a psychologist, I'm an author, I have this particular sense of humour, I dress this way, I have this set of religious and political beliefs and so on. Those are some of the dimensions of my personal identity, the way people tell the difference between me and Lynn, or me and everyone else. And yet, as Emma Thompson suggested, we might not feel, in fact, that we reach some point in our lives where we definitely will not feel as if the answer to the question, who am I really, can be found simply in those various roles as partner, friend, colleague, uh, parent, neighbor, et cetera, or even in aspects of identity that have to do with ethnicity, gender, and so on. There's more to us than any of that. Now, one of my heroes is the pioneering American psychotherapist, Carl Rogers. And Rogers wrote that one of the most common questions his clients would ask him was this, how can I get in touch with this real self underlying all my surface behavior? In other words, personal identity, the outside self, the shell, is only half the story. The deeper, and in fact, I would argue, the far more significant part of the story is the inner self, a bit like the seed hidden inside the husk of social identity. Now, I'm not denying that social identity is important. We're all fascinated by individual differences. Of course, what parent hasn't marveled at the fact that children from the same parents can turn out so differently from each other? And yet the most significant thing about us actually has nothing to do with our differences, our identity. The most significant thing is that we share a common humanity. This is the great paradox of the self. The deeper we go in our quest to find the inner self, the more we find that our essence is not about our uniqueness, it's not about our independence, but it's about our oneness and our interdependence, which is simply to say that we belong to a social species, being members of a social species, we're herd animals by nature. We're hopeless in isolation, aren't we? We need families, neighborhoods, friendship circles, work colleagues, groups, communities of all kinds to nurture us and sustain us and to give us that all important emotional security that comes from a sense of belonging. In our criminal justice system in Australia, solitary confinement is the worst punishment we can think of because it is the worst form of punishment for members of a social species. Look what happens to us when we're cut off from the human herd, we suffer. And we don't just suffer from in the obvious ways, things like anxiety and depression, but some recent American research has shown us that social isolation is also associated with an increased risk of hypertension, inflammation, cognitive decline, disturbed sleep, uh, greater openness to addiction and so on. It's no wonder that psychologists around the Western world are now saying that social isolation is a greater threat to public health than obesity is. And we know about the threat to public health from obesity and all the diseases that are associated with that. Now we have to switch our thinking and include as a great threat to public health, the problem of social isolation. This is why the deepest wisdom on the subject of knowing yourself always stresses our interdependence and our interconnectedness. Our sense of self is only really brought to life given its richest meaning when it's expressed in social interactions, like that magical thing that happens 
when a single voice is blended with a choir. Now, I've used this term common humanity, which sounds wonderful, rolls easily off the tongue, but what is uh, the essence of our common humanity? Well, as I've said, we belong to a social species and because we belong to a social species, because we rely on groups and communities and herds to sustain us, therefore the essential quality of human nature is that one thing we need to promote the social harmony that's so vital to our survival. And that quality is our capacity to love, to show kindness, compassion, respect towards everyone we meet, simply because being human, they are part of who we are. Now, I've said our capacity to love, I've used that magic word, love. Uh, it's a heavily freighted word, isn't it? We use it in so many contexts. I love chocolate. I love dogs. I love movies. I love books. I love my partner. I love my children. All forms of love enrich our lives. But when it comes to the essence of human nature and the greatest contribution we can make to a healthy, well-functioning society, compassion is the one to focus on. We typically think of love as an emotion. But in the case of compassionate love, it's more accurate to think of it as a discipline. As I interpret it, compassion is not about emotion or affection. It's not something you feel. It's something you do. It's something you give. It's a commitment to a way of being in the world in which kindness becomes our default response to everyone we encounter, not just those in obvious need of our help, not just people who are clearly distressed, and certainly not just those we happen to like or happen to agree with, but everyone, particularly including those we don't much like or don't agree with. That's the acid test of how civilized we are, that we've unlocked our capacity for compassion towards everyone we encounter. Now, having the capacity for compassionate love doesn't always translate into the daily practice of it. Let me quote uh, just a few sentences from the inner self. <clears throat> love brings out the best in us, but we don't always want the best, the best to be brought out in us because that seems to demand too much of us. Excuse me. <clears throat> love promotes goodness but we don't always want to be good. Love encourages us to live noble rather than merely moral lives, but we sometimes prefer to settle for the lazy old defense of unloving behavior. I did nothing ethically or legally wrong, as though that's all that matters. Love nurtures a generosity of spirit, but the temptation to be mean-spirited is sometimes irresistible, especially when we're feeling outraged. Love calls on us to forgive, even though revenge often seems more natural. So this idea that we're at our best, our most human, when we are motivated by compassion is hardly new or revolutionary, is it? The true mission of the world's great religions has always been to nurture our capacity for love, to encourage commitment to a life of compassion and service to others, and every non-religious, spiritual or mystical tradition and most secular philosophy points to the same idea often expressed as the golden rule that we should treat other people as we would like to be treated and also expressed in that famous remark uh, made by Mahatma Gandhi, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. And that reinforces what I described earlier as the great paradox of the self. Though we feel unique and special and individual, and we are. As humans, we share a common purpose to preserve and nurture our species, not merely through reproduction, but by creating social harmony. In other words, by living compassionately, which is not to be weak or soppy, 
or acquiescent or a martyr to every unreasonable claim on us, not at all. Being kind-hearted is not the same as being soft in the head. Compassionate people are not doormats. In fact, you could argue that the ultimate human freedom is the freedom to love compassionately. And yet, love's work sometimes feels like the hardest work of all, doesn't it? Which is why we so often try to hide from its demands on us. Understanding why and how we hide sheds some light on patterns of human behavior, especially bad behavior, that might otherwise seem puzzling. In fact, many of our problems, especially in our relationships, arise from our attempts to hide from this core truth about ourselves. Just before I conclude, just think of this uh, little metaphor. Think of the human capacity for love as being like a metaphorical light at the very core of our being. Where there's light, there are bound to be shadows and the brighter the light, the deeper the shadows. Doesn't love sometimes cast shocking shadows of hate? Doesn't every surge of faith or hope cast its shadow of doubt? And don't our actions spring from such mixed motives? It's often hard to separate the noble from the murky, the light from the dark. So if you accept uh, this metaphorical depiction of the self as energized, illuminated, enlightened by love at our center, there's no mystery about the presence of evil in the world, is there? Some of us are so daunted by the prospect of living lovingly that we retreat into the shadows of self-absorption, bitterness, envy, anger, ruthless competitiveness, etc. Well, Plato, as usual, had something useful to say about all this. He said, we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when grown-ups are afraid of the light. Hiding from ourselves is like a form of self-imposed captivity, and yet we do it sometimes for years. We might hide from our capacity for love in our busyness. We might hide in our ambition. We might hide in our nostalgia or in our IT devices or in our tendency to project our own failings and shortcomings onto others. In the new book, uh, I've identified what I think of as our top 20 hiding places. But regardless of the hiding place we choose, part of what we're hiding from may well be the challenge of compassion. Once we find the courage to come out of hiding, the main thing we'll discover is that the self is not all about me. As I've said, yes, we have our unique identity, but we all exist in a shimmering, vibrating web of interconnectedness. So when we go deeply into the inner self, we discover that we are built to love, which inescapably means we are built to connect, to cooperate, to engage, which means in turn that even in the intensely private personal journey towards self-knowledge, our relationships are our greatest teacher. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Hugh. Um, yeah, that's a fantastic overview of uh, what is really a wonderful a wonderful book um, that supports us in um, our, our own journeys. Um, and I just, to kick it off, I was just saying that you were thinking originally, uh, you said that knowing ourselves won't necessarily give us a lot of happiness. You talked about the courage required to go into those hiding places. Um, yet you call the book, The Inner self the joy of discovering who we really are so i'm wondering why you use that word joy why wasn't it the hard work of discovering who we are or the demanding work of discovering who we are so i'm just wondering why you use that word to start with yeah yes yes thanks lynn um yes i think the hard work of discovering who we are might have turned readers off in droves <laughs> uh, but also it's a serious point because i do believe um, well, well. in fact, let me take a step back. There's a, there's a famous curve uh, which captures some international research on the subject of life satisfaction. 
And what that curve shows is that from adolescence through to our middle years, typically our 40s, our level of life satisfaction declines. And then as we move into our 50s, 60s, 70s, et cetera, it, it improves. So people in later life are typically experiencing a richer sense of life satisfaction. You might even say joy than people in the first half of their lives. Now, I find that a very arresting um, piece of information, that, that U curve, um, mm -hmm. because it does remind me that in the first half of life, we're often so preoccupied with our personal identity, with building up a sense of how I'm different from you, choosing a partner, buying a house, perhaps choosing a career, um, buying a car, dressing a particular, establishing a kind of mask, a kind of facade, an identity for ourselves. Uh, and then later in life, but, but there's a lot of angst associated with that, a lot of un uneasiness and uncertainty and even unhappiness as we strive for that. And then there's a kind of release that starts to happen uh, when we begin to encounter the inner self. And some people do it early. Some people suffer the quarter life crisis at the age of 25. And I've spoken to adolescents who are well aware of the fact that they that their common humanity is the most important thing about them. But it's not typical. What's typical is that this comes to us around the middle of our lives. And then it is a joyful thing, assuming that you don't have financial woes or health issues, it's very typical to find that people as they move even into old age, even into their 70s and 80s and beyond, are getting more out of life than at earlier points in their life and experiencing uh, the joy that comes with knowing who you are. Uh, part of it is, this is who I am, take me or leave me, not being so concerned about making other people happy and so on. But, but at a deeper level, it's about what I've described in the book, Lynn, as the liberation that comes with understand, this moment of enlightenment. As I said in my opening remarks, this moment when we realize that the most significant thing about us is not our separateness, but it's our interdependence. That's a, that's a joyful discovery. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And talking about that interdependence, a recurring theme in your book is that we belong to a species that requires us to treat each other well if we're all going to survive, not just for us, but for future, uh, for the future we leave um, generations. So just wondering how that better understanding uh, of our inner selves assists in that intergenerational process. Yes, yes, thanks, Lynn. Uh, I think once we come to see ourselves not as an isolated point in time and space, but as part of a continuum, uh, our life story contributes to the human story. And that's what's rich and significant about it, even though personal aspects of it are important to us. But once we, once, I think that's a breakthrough insight for most of us. Once we realize that we are part of a continuum, then we realize that everything we do is contributing to the bigger story, that everything we do has consequences for those who follow. Uh, you've used, uh, like metaphorically, our grandchildren, whether we actually have grandchildren or not, uh, that we can't escape from this idea that each step we take, each move we make, is not just something we do to express our individualism, but it's something we do to add to the human story. Uh, and there's there's nowhere to hide from that. I mean, that, that's why, uh, you know, even, even whether or not we remember to smile at a person that we meet at the bus stop uh, this morning, uh, that, that's significant. That, that makes a contribution to the kind of place uh, we live in, the kind of society we live in. So, so I think getting away from this, I mean, we live in a culture that's highly individualistic. America even more than Australia, I think it's fair to say. Uh, highly yeah. individualistic. Yeah. The, the emphasis yeah. is on me 
and how I'm doing and what I've got and all that stuff. Once the emphasis shifts, then our responsibility to the future, I think, becomes much clearer. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point the book makes, that the inner self is not all about me. As you say, we can get hung up in our own um, concerns. So just um, balancing that focus between self-awareness and human connectedness and interdependence. Mm. Yeah, well, this is back to the idea of us as herd animals. Lynn, now, if you look, I mean, so are dolphins, so are pigeons, uh, so are various uh, form of monkeys <laughs> or dogs. Um, we domesticate them and treat them as if they're individuals, but just watch them when they get with some other dogs. Um, we do, I think, eventually have to acknowledge that identity is both our friend and our enemy. We, we, we love our sense of ourselves. We, we, as I mentioned in my opening comments, we, we're hung up on identity politics. Uh, we're hung up on identity pronouns. We're hung up on all sorts of things that are, that are all about how I'm different from you. And of course, I'm different from you. Of course, we are unique individuals. Uh, that's true of everybody on the planet. But what is equally true and far more significant is that we are interconnected. Uh, I, I think we've just got to keep reminding ourselves that when we get all obsessed about identity, what we're obsessed about is difference. Uh, once we break through our obsession with identity to a sense of our common humanity and embracing that, then what we're concerned about is not our differences, but our oneness, not our independence, mm -hmm. not how we're special, but our interdependence and what special contribution we can make to the well-being of others and through others to the species itself. Mm. Yeah, so I think too that um, the, the way in which you structure some of these um, uh, or walk us through the book uh, really supports that that understanding of how we can do that, how we can make those shifts and hold those two things together. And so I, I see that you've identified three questions that you say when we honestly face those um, to see our hiding spaces. As you said, you've identified 20 hiding spaces. So a couple of them are addiction, busyness, materialism, um, but when we look at these three questions in a different light, and those questions are, who, uh, what am I afraid of? What am I trying to prove? And what am I compensating for? Mm -hmm. So can you tell us how those questions assist in the process of seeing those hiding spaces in different ways? Yes. Yes, thanks, Lynn. Um, uh, I should begin my answer by saying that when we are not uh, being true to our deep humanity, when we have not understood that we are born to love, that that's what we are, we're love machines, uh, we're, we're, our, our, our contribution to the world, our best contribution is via compassion. Uh, when we're not true to that, when we haven't really understood that, most of us experience uh, a feeling of dissonance, a feeling of discomfort, um, sometimes a vague, unformed anxiety. We don't even quite understand why we're anxious, but very often the source of that anxiety is that we are not being true to our human nature. And so, through my years of listening to people talking about their lives and wrestling with these problems, uh, it strikes me that these three questions that you mentioned, what am I afraid of? What am I trying to prove? And what am I compensating for? Are very good test questions to see whether we are being authentic. When we look at something we've done that we're a bit ashamed of, or some relationship that seems not fully authentic, or when people are telling us that they have trouble reaching us. Sometimes a, a partner will say, I, I feel as if I can't get through to you. I don't know if this is the real you. Uh, we, we do get these little 
warnings from within and from without uh, that there's some sort of lack of authenticity. So I think that's the moment to apply these test questions and say, well, if I'm not being true to my deepest sense of humanity, if I'm not uh, living in the world as a compassionate human being, I wonder why not. I wonder if I'm afraid of something. I wonder if I'm afraid of the possibility that people won't like me as much if I stop pretending to be this kind of person and become more truly who I really am. Will people say, oh, I didn't know you were like that and not like me? The answer almost always is they'll like us even more if we become more authentic because they'll feel that some barrier has melted away and they'll find us to be a loving person rather than a defensive person, for example. So what am I afraid of? I think is a very important test question because we are often afraid of being compassionate. We're often afraid of strangers. The best way mm. to approach a stranger is compassionately. They're, they're humans, believe it or not, we belong to the same species. Kindness, compassion, respect is the appropriate way uh, to respond to strangers, but we're often afraid of their otherness and that limits our humanity. Uh, what am I trying to prove? Am I trying too hard to establish my identity? Am I trying too hard to show how wonderful I am, how unique I am, how different I am, how much better than other people I am? All of these things are a denial of our common humanity. It's a very good discipline to ask ourselves that question as well. And uh, the third one, what am I compensating for? In other words, am I behaving like this because I know I'm not yet a deeply fulfilled person and I'm trying to compensate for my own unwillingness to let go and to become more compassionate uh, by behaving in this way, which makes me feel anxious or tense or uncomfortable. It's those, those, those points of discomfort as we reflect on the way we're living our own lives that I think are a really big clue that, that we need to ask one of these or all of these test questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and I like the way you position uh, compassion as a civilizing discipline. As you say, it's not an emotion. Um, and I've heard others you know, say that compassion is a motivation. So um, I like that sense of um, the, the, uh, a civilizing um, core, you know, that, that compassion brings us. And, but we know also that um, we've, you know, when we're stressed and anxious, and at the moment the world is in a very anxious place, we're hopefully coming out of um, the pandemic, um, you know, over the next few months or uh, year. But um, just at this time, when there is a lot of uncertainty, I'm just wondering about, you know, how we can um, uh, adopt that. Um, and, and move away from that fragment, fragmentation to more um, connection um, through compassion. Mm. Yes, um, there's nothing like a pandemic to remind us that we are interconnected, that we are members of a species. The, the, the coronavirus has not arrived uh, intent on invading Buddhists or only women over 40, or only dentists, uh, the coronavirus is interested in humans because the virus uh, is attacking the species. And one of the things we've learned, if we needed to relearn it as a result of the, uh, as a result of the pandemic, is that there's no discrimination when it comes to a disease like this. So what that reminds us of, and I mean, I think Australia and New Zealand, some other parts of the world have, have demonstrated this, I think, in a, um, uh, in a very significant way. What the, the, the next step, once you realise that, is to say, OK, my response to this has to be a species-based response. In other words, 
now is the moment for me to be the com communitarian that my compassionate nature calls on me to be. This is not about me. It's not about my personal freedom. This is one of those moments when I'm called on as a human to make personal sacrifices in the interests of the common good. This is one of those occasions where I can contribute to the well being of the community that I belong to by playing by the rules, by wearing a mask or getting the vaccine or uh, sanitizing my hands or maintaining a 1.5 meter distance in a, a coffee takeaway line or something. Um, these are small sacrifices that we need to make. When we make them, there is a positive community response, which is, is what's happened in Australia. We have virtually no community transmission now because people took on the responsibility of making sacrifices for the common good. Some other parts of the world where people have been more assertive about not making sacrifices and wanting to go about uh, life as if it's normal and asserting their independence and individuality, there's been horrendous consequences. So I think this is a dramatic reminder of something that we always need to remember, that being human is not just about me and my rights and my pleasure and my happiness um, and my freedoms. It's also about me as a member of this family, this neighbourhood, this community, this workplace, this school, whatever this group might be that I belong to, because I belong to it, uh, I am uh, uh, inescapably responsible for contributing to the health of that community. And of course, I will benefit myself from the health uh, of the communities that I belong to. And um, in the book, you go through 20 hiding places. Where, which stops us from asking these questions and getting to uh, uh, our inner selves. I just wonder if you take one of those, um, perhaps busyness, that's one I know that I, um, uh, you know, can um, get lost in, um, and sort of talk a little bit about, you know, it can be business or whichever, whichever hiding place you'd like to speak to in a little bit of detail. Mm. Yes, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take business because uh, you've raised it. I mean, in Australia and probably in the countries represented by members of our audience today, the same problem occurs. But certainly in Australia, busyness has become a kind of social virtue. Um, people now greet each other in Australia by saying, well, how are you going? Busy? As though surely you're busy. You know, the switch can only be on or off. Are you busy or are you dead? Uh, now, busyness is uh, an, an anti-social cohesion state. Busyness uh, is very often a hiding place. One of the benefits of the pandemic, I think, for many people has been to pull them up short and make them realise that they were, in fact, hiding in their busyness, that they were running so hard as a way of avoiding uh, confronting a difficult relationship or spending more time with children who really needed them or uh, repairing some damage to their marriage or whatever it might be. Busyness sounds as though if he's busy, well, that, that's, you know, don't, don't, don't disturb daddy, he's busy. I can't, I can't possibly go to the neighbour's drinks on Friday night, I'm too busy. It's a classic escape because it looks as though it's justified who can criticise you for being busy? And yet I think the pandemic has pointed to the insanity of all this and to the fact that we have often run so hard, uh, worked so hard, allowed ourselves to become so busy, allowed ourselves to become addicted to our smartphone and other forms of technology, become obsessed with our work as a way of avoiding our responsibilities to show compassion, to be kinder, uh, to be more attentive listeners, to be more responsive to the needs of other people. They're our prime responsibility is not to run as hard as we can. Good. So Kate, did you want to come on or? Sure, I do. I have some um, great uh, questions from our audience, Hugh, if you wouldn't mind uh, 
addressing those. The first one is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, why doesn't why don't workplaces see the value of compassion for the organization? It's so valuable to provide space for individuals to cope with significant loss. Why is it still seen as a weakness in leaders and how can we change this? Mm. Yeah, what a wonderful question. And I'm sure almost all of us uh, can relate to this question because we've all experienced, um, well, often the brutality of the workplace. But I think one of the things, actually, I was very struck during the, uh, the lockdown uh, in Australia when people were typically working from home and having Zoom meetings such as we're having now. Um, and I, I, I remember speaking to a particular manager who said, a lot of my team are having trouble coping with the social isolation of working from home. Uh, and, they, they, and two things emerged from that. One was the manager concerned realized that she had an enormous pastoral responsibility for her team members and that actually it took the pandemic uh, and the lockdown to remind her of that, but actually it's a general truth. Uh, she also, of course, pointed out that her the members of her team were missing each other. And even though many people post pandemic in Australia are not wanting to go back to the workplace full time, but want to divide their time between working remotely and, and going to the office, they do need to go to the workplace some, some of the time in order to experience the social interaction. But I think to come right to the point of the question, Kate, we're now perhaps realize, realizing as we hadn't previously realized, that anyone who aspires to a position of leadership, anyone who aspires to accept management responsibility must acknowledge that their number one responsibility as a manager or a leader is to care for, uh, to nurture, to attend to the needs and the well-being of the people they lead. You can't get on with the work uh, while people are suffering anxiety or loneliness or bereavement or whatever might be affecting them. We have to address the human question first and then deal with the corporate question second. Uh, we can look around the world and look through history at the leaders who've been truly great. And the thing that has always marked them is their compassion their sense of needing to serve, needing to respond to the needs of and address the well-being of the people they aspire to lead. That's the revolution we need. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, wow, there's, a, there's so many here. Um, let's see, any ideas how we can raise authentic children? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of that, Kate. Uh, how, any ideas on how we can raise authentic children? Ah, yes, yes. Uh, this sounds very glib, but I can give you a very clear answer to that. Be authentic parents. <laughs> uh, children learn more from, by, from the example of their parents than they learn from anything else that happens to them in their life. Now, that doesn't downplay what they learn in the classroom. Of course, that's crucial. And in fact, the profession of all the professions on earth, the profession I, I esteem most highly is teaching, especially primary school teaching because of the enormous influence they have on the process of raising authentic children. Uh, but there's no doubt that the parental example, assuming that the family is reasonably intact and the parents are present and so on, uh, the example of parents in being true to themselves, and in particular, parents understanding their responsibility as humans to be compassionate, respectful, to show by example to their children that the funny old guy who lives at the end of the street is not to be feared, um, but is to be acknowledged, where to show compassion and kindness towards that person. Uh, the lady across the road who's got a disability, we need to help her. 
uh, we, we go, go over and see if she needs someone to, to help with her shopping. Um, uh, these little things that show by example what it means to be an authentic human, a truly loving, compassionate human, uh, right from the beginning, we need to teach our children that. We need to teach them that competition can be fun, but cooperation is what really makes the world go round. It's very nice to win, but remember, if you won, a lot of people must have lost. So remember what it must feel like to be the people who came last, as well as the people who came first. All of these things, right from the beginning, I think will help uh, to encourage a child to, um, to, be, to become more authentic. Uh, modeling compassion, modeling kindness. Uh, there's, a, there's a lovely book that's, um, that's doing the rounds at the moment called, and I now suddenly can't remember the name of it, but something like uh, The Boy, The Horse, The Mole, that's something. Um, and there's a scene in that book. It's a book for kids and adults. There's a scene in that book uh, where one of the animals says to the boy, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the boy says, kind. Uh, and I thought, ah, oh, why didn't I think of saying that when I was a kid? Because <laughs> I thought when people said, what do you want to be when you grow up? They meant, do you want to be a social researcher or a bus driver um, or, a, or a politician? Uh, and of course, that is what they meant. But, but that's a very interesting little hook to have a conversation with a child when someone says to them, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, there are two different ways of interpreting that. It could mean, what do you want to do? But maybe it means, what kind of person would you like to be? How about kind for an answer to that? I love that. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, so here's another one. Um, I, I can identify with the idea of hiding from the compassionate life, how does one make that leap to overcome the initial fear of the burden of compassion when it seems like opening a never ending and overwhelming series of demands? Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a lovely phrase that that questioner has used, the burden of compassion. Lynn referred to that uh, indirectly in, in our conversation as well, because it is a burden. As I, as I said in that brief extract I read from the book, um, you know, love brings out the best in us, but we don't always want the best to be brought out in us. There are times when we feel so hostile to someone, we're just resistant to the idea of showing compassion or respect. In other words, hiding in hatred or hiding in um, political adversarialism. Uh, or hiding in prejudice or hiding in racism or whatever it might be. They're very comfortable hiding places, especially if there are other people hiding there with us and we can reinforce each other's prejudices. The breakthrough moment is when we realize that by indulging in those prejudices, uh, by hiding in those negative emotions, by maintaining feelings of hostility towards other people that we share this planet with, we are actually diminishing ourselves. And when we realize that our life could be transformed by making compassion our default, our default position, by, by saying, well, I'm, I'm here on this planet to make the world a better place and the best way of making it a better place is to treat everyone kindly, compassionately. That, that breakthrough is the key that, that unlocks the door that's kept us captive in our hiding place. Now, okay, now I can escape. I don't have to be a racist. I don't have to be afraid of people who are different from me. If I'm a Democrat, I don't have to hate Republicans. I'm a human, we're all humans. The breakthrough moment is to say, I can still be a Democrat. I can still be a white Anglo-Saxon male. I can still be a person with this belief or that belief. And underneath all of that, uh, or perhaps I should say above all that, I can be human. Uh, that, that's, that's, that, 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 that's the breakout moment. Uh, and it doesn't mean we stop being all those things that contribute to our, our identity. It just means that we're not going to let them define us anymore. 
I'm not going to allow myself to be defined as a white supremacist or as a Buddhist or uh, as a transgender person. Th those things are important about me. Uh, people may want to know them or they may not. The most important thing about me that releases me from the captivity of prejudice and the captivity of personal identity is this moment of saying, no, actually, I'm a human and I'm born to love, not to hate. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Uh, it looks like we might have time for this one question. There's actually two people here on a, on a, uh, on a team called the uh, Humanist Australia. Um, they're just forming this team and uh, they include values of compassion, community and forgiveness. Um, one of these members was one wanting to know, um, do you have a comment on the place of humanism in helping to build compassion and self-knowledge in Australia in these days when for many of, of us, religion no longer has a pull? Hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a controversial subject. Australia is often now thought of as a secular society in which religion has no place. The, the truth about Australia in the last census is that about two thirds of Australians identify with one religion or another. 52% of Australians identify as Christian. And then if you add Buddhists, Hindus, Jews, etc., cetera, uh, you, you, you get to a bit over an additional 10%. So um, there is still an enormous amount of um, religious identification in Australia and religious influence not all positive, some of institutional influence has been appallingly negative as it has been around the world. But the positive influence that people refer to is the core values, uh, the, 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 the basic teachings in the case of Christianity, the basic teachings of Jesus uh, to do with love and forgiveness and tolerance and lack of judgmentalism and so on. Um, parables like the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, uh, that demonstrate what it, what the meaning of neighbor is. Uh, so I wouldn't write off the influence of religion, but I would say for people who have rejected religion, uh, that doesn't by any means uh, imply that they can't uh, choose some other pathway to this moment of important self-knowledge, this, this discovery of this central core truth about us that we are not alone, that we are all one, that we do exist in this shimmering, vibrating web that I referred to. Now, religion at its best is all about encouraging compassion and encouraging neighborliness. Uh, take religion out of the equation and we need other um, leaders in particular to encourage those same things. I keep on muting myself. I, um, well, we are just about out of time. There are a couple more questions. I apologize that we weren't able to get to those. Um, thank you uh, to our audience for being here with us today. Uh, thank you, Lynn, so much for thank being you. an amazing host. Yes, I appreciate you. your yeah. energy. And uh, can I just say, if there are people who'd like to learn more about the Charter for Compassion and what it's doing here in Australia, uh, Kate did put our web page um, uh, earlier. Uh, I'd invite you to go and visit that web page. And if you'd like to be in contact, uh, there's uh, an email there, info at charterforcompassion.com.au. Great, thank you for that. And I just put the link in again in case this is the Thanks, first Kate. time. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you so much. And Hugh, wow. Again, thank you so much for the gift of this book to the world and um, for your time uh, today. Um, thank you so much for being here with us. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, Lynn. Yeah, thank you, Hugh, again. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I invite you all to be with us next month for uh, Tyson's book. Um, it is called Santa. I happen to have it right here. Um, so please, please join us for that. And you can just go to the charter uh, compassion.org um, and go to our global read page and, and see what we've got coming up as well. So 
Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Have a good evening. Have a good morning, wherever you're joining us from. And thanks again to both of you, Lynn and Hugh, for your time and energy. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Take Kat. Care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.